So I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Galatians uh, chapter 3. Um, I don't have a lot of overheads. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's a Bible in the pew. We're reading from the same version you see in the pew. Uh, we're going to be moving around quite a bit, and I'm going to ask for your full attention while we go through this material. Uh, we're going to start out with Galatians 3, 26 through 28. Let me read this to you. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The reading of God's word, brothers and sisters. The, um, I got into the ministry in 2002. Uh, I became senior pastor here in 2005. And one of my primary duties back then was counseling. Um, it didn't take too long till I realized that some of the things that we were teaching from the pulpit uh, were not being applied in the same fashion that we had hoped they would in the pews. And one of those was our attitude towards women. Um, and I saw a lot of uh, misapplication of what the term male headship means. Uh, so we kind of went on uh, a journey, me and the elders, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a little bit. Um, but in 2015, so now we're talking almost 10 years ago, I delivered this sermon that I'm about to share with you again. Now I've made adjustments to bring us into 2024. Um, but I'm going to ask you just to put aside whatever you're thinking right now. <laughs> okay, just put it aside and bear with me. It's a long sermon. Um, you know, I kid around about long sermons. This one's going to take a little while. Uh, but I'm also going to ask you to, if you can, uh, follow through with me on the scriptures that we're going to look at. Uh, make notes, go back and check for yourself. I want you to see these things for yourself. I don't want you to just take my word for what this Bible says. I want you to be able to read these things for yourself. So with all that being said, I, I want to share with you, there are times, there are times when, when a word, one word can mean exactly the opposite of itself. Have you ever seen this sort of thing happen? Uh, I mean, it's the English language, right? I can be homeward bound, moving about freely, or I can be bound and gagged and unable to move at all. I can be uh, in a storm, my car can be in a storm, and it can weather the storm, which means it'll get through it pretty well. Or my car can be weathering away, which means that it's rusting and falling apart, which is usually how my car is. I can strike an opponent, hit him soundly and hard, or I can strike out, swing and miss completely. How do we know? How do we know how to apply the word? Most of you know the answer, right? Context. It's context. We can tell the difference by the context, how it's used in a sentence or a paragraph. Life can be that way. You know, somebody says, here comes your dad. And, you know, I had a great relationship with my father. When somebody says, here comes your dad, I kind of get excited. I, I, I want to see him. For some folks, that phrase is fraught with fear. And, and that perception can last through a lifetime, making fathers sound like a blessing to some people and a note of anxiety to others. Even within that context, you know, my mom would say at the end of the day, here comes your dad, and I had a pretty good day. That was pretty exciting. If I had not had a pretty good day, I'm like, oh my gosh, my dad's coming. So context can be everything. Scripture, Scripture is the same way. We are not going to know how to interpret the Scriptures until we know the context of verse was written in. And I'll tell you something, a lot of damage is done by people taking Scripture out of context. Sometimes Scripture seems perfectly clear on an issue. 
But when we start digging down and looking at the context, it's not quite as clear as we thought. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. There are, there are elements of Scripture that are perfectly clear. There's one way to salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Saved by grace, by faith. Amen? Okay. But not all Scripture is exactly that clear. This is why, this is why we have Presbyterians and Baptists. For those Pre- Presbyterians and Baptists that believe in Jesus Christ, we're all going to get together in heaven and probably going to have a good laugh at all of the doctrines that we embrace. And the amazing thing about it is, there will be fundamentalists there, there will be charismatics there, uh, there will be Calvinists, and, and there might even be some Arminianists. Just kidding, just kidding. Let me give you an example of something that might not be so clear as we think it is. Very first church council that convenes in Jerusalem, a decision is made to circumcise the Jews and not to put that burden upon the Gentiles. And as a result of that, Paul has Timothy circumcised, but not Titus. Now, why, why on earth would that happen? Are they both in the body of Christ? Yes. Why circumcise one and not the other? Are there two sets of rules? Is there a set of rules that's good for one group and maybe not good for the other group? What about Romans chapter 10? which starting in verse 12 says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we kind of see in that that all believers are equal, don't we? Then why does Paul circumcise one and not the other? Was one decision wrong and the other decision right? I want to show you today that both of Paul's decisions were right. We'll look at it a little bit later. I'm going to show you why as well. So as pastors and elders, we're in an elder-led church, you know that. We're faced with decisions similar to Paul's all the time. And to reach the answers, we have to examine the scriptures. Then we have to make a determination as to how those scriptures should apply to our congregation, our body here. Sometimes scriptures are very clear. It's not very much of a discussion. Other times they're not so clear. And, and then there are times when there seem to be two answers. And as elders, we have to choose one. Now, I don't have to remind you how difficult the lockdowns were when we had COVID. And there were answers all over the board. And, there, I mean, there were answers all over our congregation. What do we do about meeting? What do we do about mass? What do we do about, oh my gosh, vaccinations? You know, and so we had to make decisions. We, we, we never took a public stance on vaccinations. That's up to you. And, and it's okay, whatever you decided, okay? But we had to make a decision on how we met and when we met, whether or not we should have mass, whether or not we should have an area for mass, and how long the meeting should be. And, and I got to tell you something, those were hard decisions. We had to get the local sheriff and the police chief involved in our discussions. We had a meeting right here at the church with 11 other churches over, what do you guys think as the law enforcement officers? Because we were hearing all sorts of terrible things, and we found out they were willing to work with us. We were willing to work with them. Sometimes there's two answers, and we have to choose one. Now we know that in the scriptures, there is a non-negotiable absolute truth in them for all of those times. But we also know that the church doesn't always have access to that truth because Scripture is very clear about one thing is that, that we see through a mirror dimly. We three see through a glass dimly right now. One day we'll know everything. We'll see face to face. But we're told, we're told to strive for truth. As Paul says to the Corinthians in, in our example of today, we're going to... Uh, uh, we're going to look at that passage, and we're going to look at the roles women play in the church. Now, I, I want to acknowledge that this issue can be enormously emotionally charged. It's a prime example that, of the dilemma that we have as leaders. We find ourselves in from time to time, and the scriptures might not be as clear as a lot of people think they are, and that can make for some tension. But we need to acknowledge that there's tension in the Bible. Amen? 
Okay, I can see here. <laughs> We're all like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> and that, that tension in the Bible can upset our notion of how nice and tidy our faith should be, how nice and tidy God should be, or our notion that God favors one denomination over another or one set of beliefs over another. Uh, so l- let me give you so- a few examples, because I'm not saying that this is an everything goes situation. We have, to, we have to embrace the elemental truth of the Bible. But God gives us some flexibility in, in the non-essential doctrines. We'll talk about that. For instance, some people are not comfortable with scriptural tension between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Can I get an amen on that? Okay. Yet, it's there. And, and we affirm both of them. We affirm God's divine sovereign nature in determining who will be united with his son for all eternity. Yet, we affirm that there needs to be a response to the gospel. How does that work out? I don't know. I can't make those dots connect. I can't make sense out of it, but God can. And the more we look at that situation, the more it should drive us to our knees and go, this is a holy and awesome God. He's beyond my comprehension in this issue. I don't get it, but I trust him. And the final analysis, issues like this one don't determine our eternal destiny. I mean, we're not going to get to heaven, and the question isn't going to be, how'd you get here? Did you believe that you made the decision or that God chose you? The only question is, what do you make of my son, Jesus Christ? But for a lot of folks, the position on these manners can be firmly seated in teaching that might go back in their family for generations. You grew up in a denomination that thought, here's another one. You grew up in a denomination that thought speaking in tongues was evil and wrong. It might be difficult for you to sit next to somebody, a brother or sister, to believe tongues are a gift. That doesn't make one right and one wrong. Some think tongues have faded away, some don't. It's okay. It's okay. So it's important, all that being said, for a church to have a clear, doctrinal identity. And we strive to do that here. We labor over who we are and what we believe. We sweat out our doctrine item by item. We sweat out our theology. Paul thought it was important. So do we as a group of leaders. If a particular doctrine is non-essential to the faith, we realize that other people might believe differently. And frequently, for very good reasons, that's why some denominations baptize babies and some don't. We're all part of the body of Christ, so are we. We don't want to judge them, and we hope that they're not going to judge us. So this is how, this is the process we went through in our position on women leading songs during the service. And we've actually had this position since 2006. The elders gave up every Saturday morning for about six months or so to work through the issue. We dove deeply into the language of the passages. We looked at some of the traditional classic teachers on this, consulted papers and looked at commentaries. We prayed, we debated, we prayed some more. And as a body of leaders, we learned quite a bit. We learned a lot about context. It wasn't the last time we made that kind of effort. Every doctrinal decision that we've made over the last 20 years has been met with intense scrutiny, particularly of the Scriptures. Not of what people say about the Scriptures, but what the Scriptures say. A lot of prayer and a lot of debate. There are types of things you don't see the elders doing. These things don't happen on Sunday morning. They don't happen on the weekend. The prayer and formation of our teaching happens on on Wednesday nights, sometimes Saturday morning. Happens on countless emails, phone calls, gallons of coffee. Then once we're thoroughly fleshed an issue out, we, we move forward. We don't always have consensus, but we've learned that grace is important. 
And it's important to hold firm. When it's important to hold firm, we pray and we walk out of the room exhausted and edified, but united. That's exactly what happened on this issue. Now, I understand that there are a lot of folks that firmly believe that women are not to speak in an assembly. Some think it's edgy or even wrong for a woman to pray or read scripture. Wrong to say anything. Let me tell you something. I found that out in 2015. (laughs) I thought, oh, I've got this beautiful scripture message. And I thought they were going to kill me at the end. (laughs) So I survived. My wife protected me. Thank you, Kelly. (laughs) So, you know, that's out there. And some people think that women should be able to do everything. That's out there, too. So we're going to take our time this morning and look at the full body of Scripture and demonstrate that we haven't made our decision lightly. First, I'd like to start out with who we are. In regards to women in ministry, there are two types of evangelical churches today. I don't like these words, but they're out there, okay? Uh, those who believe women can hold all positions in the church today, and those who believe that only men should be pastors and elders. The first group are called egalitarians. The second group are called complementarians. I don't, again, I don't like these words. They carry a lot of baggage. Uh, but to keep things simple, Warrington Bible Fellowship is a complementarian church and always has been. Some people think a change occurred when I took over senior pastor. It didn't. That, that's what it was before I got here. So the problem we face for a lot of people is that complementarian has somehow come to mean male superiority. I'm not sure the modern church has done much to dispel that notion. Matter of fact, they may have, might have encouraged it more than they should have. But it's not a scriptural principle. So I want to take a look at what complementarianism is according to scripture. You turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And those of you who are familiar with that chapter know that I'm going to go there. We find Paul giving instructions on how to structure the church service. In Ephesus, now to give you some context, if in Ephesus the men were arguing during a service and the women were disrupting the service. It was chaos, making a spectacle of themselves. All in all, it's a picture of of just a messy service. Paul tells them all to calm down. He's going to do the same thing in the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, And he wants them to conduct their services in order and not in confusion. So he's saying the same thing here in 1 Timothy 2, starting with 8. I desire that in every place the men should pray lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So Paul is addressing the anger and quarreling that they're experiencing. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So he's now addressing the fact that women are making a spectacle of themselves. Then he says in verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. So he wants the men to stop bickering. He wants the women to sit down and listen to the preaching and teaching that's going on. And just to make the overall structure of how this goes forth, Paul says in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. So it clearly tells us that the men, the leaders of the church, should have authority over the service. Paul ends the verse with, she is to remain quiet. Now, there are a lot of heartfelt perceptions that are based on that particular phrase. But keep it in mind that it is in the context, Paul is addressing a service that's out of control. The men were yelling, the women were trying to take charge, Paul tells them all to sit down, listen to the leaders who are men, the elders of the church. So this is not a case of, oh, that was in Ephesus, it doesn't apply to us. It applies to having an orderly service, that nobody is to stand up and commandeer the service. Nobody is to create a distraction. So just to make everything clear, 
Paul says this. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over men. She is to remain quiet. Men have authority over the serve. Well, why? I mean, if we're all equal, why would that be? Well, Paul knows there's a little bit of a void there. And he says it's because of the created order. God will build his church the way God built the world. For In verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now, we've seen a lot of evil based on that, too. <laughs> And we have to be careful what we do with it. Later on in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we see the qualifications for elders. Now, we roll from the order in the service to what an elder should look like. And they're built on the requirement that the elders be men. A lot of debate over, oh, they just use the word men. But it's pretty clear that the elders should be men. They're the head of the household. They have one wife. Uh, all the pronouns here are male and gender and need to stay that way. So, headship in the church is established as male only. But know this, the males have authority, but the better reading about that might be that the males have accountability. They're responsible. It's not superiority. The structure that Paul prescribes here brings order, but not a hierarchy of value. It's the way the Holy Trinity is structured, isn't it? We know our doctrine of the Trinity. There's one God. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. Three equal persons, but with some structure. There are a lot of similarities between the church and the family. You can see them in Ephesians chapter 5. You can look there later on. But particularly if you look at verse 25 to 27, a lot of us are familiar with wives submit yourselves to your husbands. Right, guys? We like that. I know you're all afraid to say yes. <laughs> we seldom hear that one of the man's responsibilities is to develop and nurture the gifts and the, the sanctification of the wife so that she can be all that God has equipped her to be. It would be foolish. Just think about this. It would be foolish for those of us who are married, we know this, to assume that women have no value and no voice. It would be equally foolish to think that women bring nothing to the church service. There are too many passages in the Bible that say that they do. So it would be a mistake to think that Paul is telling us that women are not allowed to speak under any circumstances in the assembly. And if you hang with me, I'm going to show you why. But first, let's take a look at another verse. It affirms male headship in the church, but it's also another verse that's frequently taken out of context and has caused a lot of heartaches for centuries. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'll give you a second to get there. This is important for you to see. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You can scroll. You can turn the pages of your book. We're going to be looking at verses 33 and 34. But while you're turning there, let me read you the preceding verses, starting at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Now, Corinth had the same problem that Ephesus did. And this isn't a prescriptive uh, description of the service. Paul is talking about bringing order into a service in Corinth that is marked by chaos. So verse 26 here is a corrective, not a guideline. Paul is saying, when you come together, everyone's talking at the same time. This looks crazy to visitors that are coming in. Look at the context of the passage. So he gives them guidelines, starting in verse 27. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. Verse 28, but if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So there is a scriptural mandate to speak in tongues, but it's not in all the churches in the New Testament. It's only in one. Paul later on says, well, not everybody's going to speak in tongues. What do we do when they do? Here are the guidelines right here. If there are any tongues, 
They will not be spoken by everybody at the same time, and not everybody shouting, but only by two or three in the most without an interpreter who needs to be identified ahead of time. There's no tongues. Then Paul goes into prophecy. It's almost the same guidelines. Paul wants to make sure that if there's prophecy, that that's done in order as well. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and be encouraged. And then who are these others they're talking about? He defines it in verse 32. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Paul details the order by saying the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Let me paraphrase this for you. It's Kavakis paraphrase. The teaching of the prophets, all the prophets, all the teachers who come into the church should be evaluated by the prophets that are in the church. Paul's calling for accountability in teaching. Accountability in the leaders. And the elders, the elders are the ones who approve the teaching. This is why, before we have a guest speaker here at Warrington Bible Fellowship, we want to know who they are and what they believe. We want to know where they come from. And they need to know who we are. It's another thing that goes on behind the scenes. We have these discussions with people come in. Let me tell you who we are. These are the doctrines we believe in. You may believe in something else. We're going to ask you to respect our doctrine. We'll respect yours when we come to your church. And then Paul explains in verse 33 of 1 Corinthians 14, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Let me tell you something. All kinds of damage has been done about this verse. And I've had people say, women shouldn't be allowed to speak in the sanctuary, you know. Oh. So I had to tell Kelly, you can't talk next Sunday. Don't say hello to anybody. Don't say goodbye to anybody. If you want to say hello to Nancy, you come to me and say, I'd like to say hello to Nancy. I'll go over and say, Nancy Kelly says hello, but you can't talk either. (laughs) So is that what Paul is saying here? Oh, some people, no, no, no. There's, there's a word in here that means speaking from the pulpit. There's no word in there that means speaking from the pulpit. Check the language. So if none of the ladies are allowed to utter a word, to say hello, that means they're not allowed to give their amen to the teaching. So either, either Paul is telling the ladies to be completely silent Or, in the context of the passage, he's telling them that they're not the ones that the preacher-teacher is going to be accountable to. The women are not the ones who evaluate the teaching at the leadership level. Likewise, the authority and teaching that we see in 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 is the authority and teaching on a leadership level. We know that. Because as soon as Paul establishes all that in 1 Timothy 2, he goes into qualifications for elders. Now, all this is clearly laid out in 1 Timothy, Titus and 1 Corinthians, the passages that we've looked at and you've seen before. But they, they have to, you see, here's, here's where things get sticky. They have to work in harmony with the rest of the Bible. And what these passages show us is the structure of the Headship of the church is male-oriented, but they don't describe the roles that all the members play. And we're going to see that in other passages. So so our takeaway, I just want to be very clear, our takeaway so far is that the elders should be men. That's who we are. That's who Warranted Bible Fellowship is. We are a complementarian church. Again, the word has some baggage. Structured like the the Trinity with uh, clearly defined head, clearly marked line of accountability, 
and equality among all of our members. Now, we're not typical when it comes to that. People hear that I'm an expositor, that that's how we preach. Um, you know, we're reformed in our theology. And they show up expecting us to be typical reformed. Well, that can mean a lot of different things. We don't always meet those guidelines. So I'm here today to tell you that there's more than that. There's more freedom for our ladies than a lot of people might lead you to believe. For centuries, and I'm talking about for centuries, the woman's role in the church has been defined by what they cannot do. And what I said in 2015 is we need to start defining women by what they can do, not what they cannot do. I had a guy come up to me after I did that sermon. He said, I've never been in a church that prohibited women from doing things. I said, really? He said, yeah, I've been in 12 churches. I said, so the other 11 churches you were in, you had women Sunday school teachers? Oh, no, they can't do that. Oh, you had women pray? Oh, no, they can't do that. I said, what did they do? He said, what women are supposed to do, they worked in the nursery in the kitchen. Yeah, it sounds a little funny, but that's out there. I mean, we, as we got to this position, we had a long debate on how old the, the male children could be in a Sunday school class before they had to leave the class if a woman was teaching. I don't, uh, and I'm sitting there going, well, I, what age do we do that? The age of accountability? I mean, for the Jews, it was... 12 for the girls, 13 for the boys. Is it the age to vote? Is it the age to get a driver's license? Is it the age to go fight for your country? What age do we use when we say, okay, all the guys have got to leave the room? Some people believe that if a woman is teaching and a man walks in the room, the woman has to go silent. So is that what the scriptures tell us? You know, I know where it comes from. I'm just saying damage has been done. Without abandoning our firmly held belief in complementarianism, we can free our women of any insinuation that they have less to contribute than our men. My point is this. Women can, women can and should have a speaking role in our service. And it should happen under the authority and supervision of our pastors and elders. But the women should be permitted to pray, exhort, and read Scripture in the assembly. That's what we see in the Scriptures. Now, we know it's true because we see it in the rest of the Bible. As a matter of fact, just as the, the male leader, headship guidelines, we can find freedom for women in a lot of Paul's writings. Sounds like opposite, but I'll show you that it's not. Yeah, look, look, let's back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn there. Now, in 14, Paul says that, I don't allow a woman to speak in church, okay? In, in, in 1 Timothy 2, he says, I don't allow a woman to have authority uh, or teach a man, okay? And so here we are in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul's giving instructions on how to prophesy in the service. Now, we know it applies to a corporate service, because at the very end of the passage, it says this in verse 16, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. It applies to everybody. It's not just Corinth. But if there's any doubt, Paul makes sure that they know he's addressing the way they meet when he says in verse 17, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Paul, again, is the whole book of 1 Corinthians is a corrective not a prescriptive book. He's correcting the way men and women act during the service. The men are acting in a dishonorable manner by not honoring their wives and arguing with each other. The women are acting in a dishonorable manner by the way that they are conducting themselves, the way they're dressing, and the way they're not recognizing the authority placed over them. Now, you know, the context of that was there was an aggressive feminist movement in Rome in the uh, first and second centuries AD. Women were shaving their heads, trying to commandeer public forums. They were disrupting gatherings, and all this was creeping into the church, just like it was in Ephesus. 
And that's what Paul's addressing here. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3 through 5. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Every wife who... Are you there? Are you looking at the passage? Does it say every wife who remains silent... Does it say every wife who's not allowed to speak? It says every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaving. The shaved heads left uncovered. Now, now this is not just a cultural perspective. We need to understand what's being said here. They're a sign of rebellion. Meant to shock and call attention to the feminist protest. Paul is telling them to cover up their sin of rebellion. He's talking about more about hearts. Listen carefully. He's talking more about hearts than he's talking about hats. He's talking more about the attitude that's inside these women that are doing this rather than their garb. He addresses that in other places. He's saying... Put on a hat to cover your sin. Stop being so self-centered and making such a display of your rebellious heart. Then the women are given guidelines for prophesying during the service. They are to speak out and pray, but only under the oversight of the leadership of the church and in respect for their husbands. By the way, the men have the same guidelines. Not picking out the women. Now, why do I say that we, we see that th- th- there are appropriate times and an appropriate way for a woman to speak in the service, but only under the oversight of the leaders? See, that's what the head covering is for. It's, it's a sign of functioning under the authority of the leadership. If there's no rebellion against it, it's not the head covering that matters, it's the heart. Now, for another example, take a look at at a prophet. We we heard about it. Prophetess Anna. Anna. Go to Luke chapter 2. Go ahead, turn there. In Luke 2, Mary and Joseph have brought the baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. Simeon says a blessing. And then we see this in verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. She went home at the end of the day. So nobody was allowed to live in the temple. And verse 38, and coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to only the women. What's it say? Speak to him to who? All the people in the temple who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Anna speaks to everyone, giving glory to God and praising him, exhorting everyone in the temple. So in Exodus 15, 20, um, you can go there if you like, but Miriam is leading singing. Yeah, she leads the women uh, through verse 20 and 21. But if you look at verse 22, it's a prelude to the whole nation moving out from the Red Sea. And we see Miriam listed as a leader in Micah chapter 6, verse 4. Write that down right alongside Moses and Aaron. The, the wording, the, the order of the names there is important because in Jewish tradition, the older brother would come first and then the younger brother, and they really wouldn't mention the sister very much. But God says to his people, I gave you Moses, names the younger brother first. He's given him the structure of leadership. And then Aaron, and then Miriam, one of the three leaders of Israel, operating within a structure that God created. Well, that's not enough to convince me, John. What about Deborah? 
a judge leading her people in a victory song in Judges chapter 5. You might think about going over that song. I mean, God said, she made up this song and I'm putting it in scripture. What do we do with that? Deborah was a leader in Israel, but you know what? She functioned under the structure that God had given Israel where the priests were the overseers. We see Mary Magdalene given the very first charge to share the gospel with a group of men in John chapter 20. In short, we see that given the proper structure, a woman can pray, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, can exhort Anna in Luke 2, Mary in John 20, lead singing and recite scripture, Miriam and Deborah. Ooh. And then we got... We got Priscilla and Aquila. What do we do with that? I mean, this is what our entire Apollos program is based on. Priscilla and Aquila. What what chapter is it? Acts chapter 18. Check this later on. There's Apollos. He's preaching. He's doing a great job. Priscilla and Aquila listen to him and take him aside and teach him the deeper things. I've had people say to me, oh... Don't you know what happened there, John? No, what? Priscilla taught him how to keep his house, and Aquila taught him all the theological stuff. It's important. Word, name, order is important. It's important when they talk about taking Apollos deeper. Paul mentions Priscilla first. See, these are, these are tough situations, aren't they? We don't quite know what to do with them. So the tendency is to ignore them. Yet all of it is clearly written in our Bible. And it is difficult to see if you don't go looking for it. And I'd be remiss if I didn't show you what it said. So it doesn't mean that someone who practices something different is doing something wrong. Just listen to me. It does mean that there might be a greater blessing available to us as a body if we're willing to set aside some of those deep-seated perceptions and some of those things that are taken out of context. We decide to look at women a little bit differently. So we have women leading our worship from time to time. On occasion, they pray and read Scripture. There may be a class from time to time that will happen under the authority of the elders where a woman would be teaching. And that will be in harmony with the teaching and doctrine that we've established here at Warrington Bible Fellowship. And if you wonder what that is, just let me know. I'll send you all the documents you need. We've got, we've got our constitution, we've got our bylaws, and we've got a binder called philosophy of ministry. Now, I want to acknowledge some people are going to think this is all wrong, and some people are going to agree wholeheartedly with it. It's okay. How do we, how do we know? How do we know if it's one or the other. I think God gives us some grace and allows the elders to make a decision. And the reason I say that is, is, let's go back to where we started, Paul, Timothy, and Titus, and the whole circumcision deal. Timothy had to be circumcised. Titus didn't. Both decisions were correct. Both were right. Even though they seemed to be opposite of each other, Paul had the grace to do what was necessary to preach the gospel. Timothy would be leading a church mostly comprised of Jews who held circumcision to be very important. So Paul goes to Timothy and says, look, Timothy, you're going to have to be circumcised. Otherwise, you're going to have no credibility with these people. Titus, Titus is put in charge of a church of Gentiles who could care less. So he says, okay, Titus, you don't have to do this. As a matter of fact, there's a little bit of an attitude about Jews among the Gentiles that they feel that they're superior. So we're not going to have you circumcised. The council in Jerusalem had already decided their authority, their covering, they had already decided not to burden the Gentiles with the ordinance of circumcision. Paul didn't violate any scriptural principle, although there are those who accuse him of doing it. He was dedicated, fully committed to the word of God, And he had the liberty to function 
within that word. And I think we have the same liberty here today. And that's why we should show grace. And listen with respect as our ladies from time to time exercise their gifts, gifts of praying and singing and exhortation. I had hoped in 2015 that this would be the beginning of a dialogue. Um, Unfortunately, some people don't really want to dialogue on it. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, You know, what's important is that we're all in the kingdom. Amen? Uh, So some people are uncomfortable with this. I get it. Some people are overly comfortable with it. I get it. Um, But whatever we do, we need to be able to move together. Together. Uh, That's something that we've learned over the years, isn't it? Keep this in mind. Christ died to set us free. Look what Paul says and hear the gospel in our passage for this morning. Galatians 3, 26 through 28. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. The Jew would read, you are all men and women, children of God. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, for there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. None of that negates the roles that God has created in the church, but it does encourage us to set aside old ideas of superiority and inferiority. Now, we're all one in Christ. We should have the freedom to use our gifts within the structure that God provides for his church. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, Next week, I have something equally boring. Um, We're going to talk about the sovereignty of God. And we're going to ask the question, how sovereign is God? It's a tough one. And my heart for this congregation is that we embrace the scriptures for what they say, not what we're told they said. I've given you all the material to look at these things yourself. If you need a summary of this, we'll get it into your hands. Just let me know. But next week, we're going to talk about living in the sovereignty of God, how God is sovereign over creation, how God is sovereign over history, And how, yes, God is sovereign over our individual lives. And then after that, we will move into a series in Colossians. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks, Lord, that your word sometimes challenges us. We give you thanks, Father, that the body of Christ is wide and diverse and deep. Uh, Father, and we may have our differences on non-essential doctrine, Father, but we can unite in the doctrine that tells us that Jesus Christ saves, that once we repent, we confess our sins, and we will receive eternal life as we call him Lord. And so we thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. We thank you for the complexity of applying it to our lives, Father, knowing that we will strive after this perhaps for the rest of our lives, and we won't have a full understanding until we stand in glory. We look forward to that day. Meanwhile, Lord, we say, in you we place our trust. In you we have faith. And we pray this in our Lord and Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Anybody would like to talk to me, I'll be right over here. Uh, We'll have a short meeting for those who would like to help out with the festival uh, in just a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in.